All right, everyone, welcome to this Twimmel demo cast. I've got Vila Tulos here. Vila is a manager of machine learning infrastructure at Netflix. If you, that name sounds familiar, it's because we spoke, uh, well, we spoke back in early December. I guess you would have heard that show in December as well. Um, we actually originally uh, did that interview at AWS reInvent where uh, Netflix launched Metaflow, which is an open source framework for data science. But we're going to learn all about that today. Uh, Vila, welcome to the demo cast. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we're going to get this started by having you share a little bit of the background of Metaflow for those that have not had an opportunity to listen to that show. Absolutely, I'm happy to do that. And. Uh, well, what I was planning to do is that I'm, I'm just like following uh, our documentation that you can find at metaflow.org. So you can definitely go there by yourself. And let me, let me like just um, start by giving a very high level overview, like why we built Metaflow at Netflix in the first place, like very quickly. So Metaflow is, is a package that helps data scientists, like originally at Netflix, now outside as well. And, and the, basically the world that we were seeing is that like, well, we are all about data scientists and data scientists are solving business problems at Netflix and, and in many other places as well. And, and we saw that like as, as long as you are using notebooks, life is really simple and, and fun. And especially like due to the fact that there are these amazing libraries like TensorFlow and, and PyTorch and XGBoost and so forth. So when you are like, when you have a nice business problem, you are iterating it on it uh, in the notebook using these off the shelf libraries, super, super happy stuff, easy, easy, easy peasy. But now there are, of course, these questions that, well, how do I get data in my notebook? I have to reach out to a data warehouse, like it's a little bit more complicated. Next question is that how does the data end up in the right format in the data warehouse? So you need to have some kind of an ETL process, whether it's the data scientist doing the ETL. I mean, depends, of course, on the company. But overall, like we have the mindset that the more data scientists can do by themselves, the better. So we would like to empower them to be very autonomous. But then the question is that, okay, how do you deploy these things in production? I mean, once you have everything running in a notebook and everything, you, you get data from a data warehouse and you have an ETL running and now you are supposed to deploy it somewhere. It's not supposed to run it on your, on, on your laptop. And typically these days production means maybe in some cloud environment, maybe in some container management system somewhere. So you have to start worrying about maybe containers, Docker containers, stuff like that. And, and that gets a bit more complicated. And especially let's say that like you have all this running and your model builds, let's say once a day and like a data flows through there and there's the question of, okay, so how do you actually like use the results somehow? And now one way to use the results is that you deploy the model as, a, as a, another microservice maybe um, to do real-time inference. And that means more and more and more Docker containers. And at least at Netflix, uh, for many internal applications, what happens is that then these um, models are being used by, by some dashboards to help decision making. Let's say what kind of shows we want to produce. Do we want to do another season of Stranger Things or not? So then like you get this dashboard. And, and now like the interesting thing is that like what happens is that now like the business stakeholders look at these dashboards and, uh, and, and the, really the two things can happen. Either they like the results, in which case you really start doing the whole cycle again. I mean, by improving the model, adding more data or so forth, or like maybe the results are not so great, in which case you start working as a data scientist, you start working um, on another project. So the cycle starts again. So basically we saw this whole cycle happening over and over again, that like data scientists start prototyping something in a notebook. I mean, life is easy using off the shelf libraries, getting data is actually surprisingly hard, like running things in production is surprisingly hard. How you interface with other systems is surprisingly hard and especially iterating the whole thing quickly over and over again, especially like when you want to, of course, like work together with your colleagues. I mean, that can be tricky. And, and that's kind of the motiva motivation, like why we built Metaflow. And uh, now the, um, and before you do that, I've got to say, I love how the facial expression on that data scientist. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that is, that is like that more. From the real life. So. What, uh, what assumptions are you making, if any, about the environment of the user? Um, you mentioned yeah. data warehouse and ETL. Are you assuming uh, that that stuff exists or do you support it if it does but don't require it? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So actually, um, that's a kind of a good segue to this picture here. So uh, we view like that basically you need this like a tech stack um, in order to run these ML workflows. And 
we assume that you have some kind of a data warehouse. And then depending on the company, this might be, let's say, Amazon Redshift, or it might be that you have a big data lake in S3 or, or like something like that. But I mean, the data needs to be somewhere, so we don't provide the data warehouse. Then um, you need to do something with data. So you need to have some kind of a compute layer. And, and typically these days, this is like some kind of a container management system might be Kubernetes or what we support out of the box in open source is AWS Batch. So which basically just gives you containers in the cloud. You can uh, just get them on demand basis. And the next layer is that, well, it's very, very convenient if you have some kind of a scheduler that orchestrates your ETL. And we really feel that it's really powerful um, if you can connect your ML workflows to the same scheduler that runs the ETL. So you can update your models whenever data updates. And then like when you go upward, upwards um, in the stack, there are like things that, okay, how do you architect the code and how do you version the code? And those are the things that Metaflow really helps the, the, the data scientists to do effectively. And then when it comes to the very top of the stack, the model development and feature engineering, actually, we want to be like rather unopinionated about uh, for the reason that there are so many amazing packages out there. And uh, and usually it's that this is like really the area that data scientists know the best and they are happy to kind of uh, really use the best tool for the job so they can use whatever they want here. But yes, I mean, to answer your question, we assume you have some, some kind of a data warehouse, you have some kind of compute platform and like you have maybe some kind of a scheduler, although that's not totally required. We support AWS out of the box. We support local development out of the box and we are actively looking into providing other integrations as well. Mm -hmm. And so when you say you support AWS out of the box, does that have specific implications at the data warehouse level? Like, do you need to be using Redshift or S3 or if you're using Snowflake or uh, something else, uh, you, is there a path for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, uh, internally at Netflix, we um, store everything in S3. So S3 is our data lake. Uh, we use Hive tables, Iceberg tables that manage basically parquet files in S3. So that's how we do it. And we actually provide an extremely high performance data path like for that kind of setup. However, by no means Metaflow is exclusive to that setup. So like another typical approach might be that you get data from a data warehouse using SQL and then like wherever you can execute SQL, maybe it's Spark, maybe it's Redshift, maybe it's whatever you have, and that should work as well. Uh, but I mean, specifically, since, I mean, the pattern that we use internally is, is uh, this like S3 data lake. I mean, that is something that like we, we support especially well. Okay. Got it. And uh, any assumptions or limitations in terms of the types of models? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Now, um, we uh, internally at Netflix, we support a really wide variety of different use cases. So, it goes all the way from um, NLP and, and even computer vision to uh, more um, classical statistics for to analyze uh, results of, of A-B experiments to causal machine learning. And, and then like in the other end of the spectrum, we have things that technically are not even machine learning, like operations research, different kind of optimization tasks. So okay. in that sense, like we are very agnostic about use case and especially in contrast to many other like frameworks that you may have seen uh, uh, like uh, coming out over the past couple of years, we are not exclusive to deep learning. So we have actually many use cases, users who use scikit-learn or XGBoost or other more classical ML methods. So at the same time, we have a good number of users doing deep learning. So, but it's really not exclusive to that. Okay. So I can um, it, like um, like give you like a, just an idea, like kind of a how, how this like a stack, what we have here, how it maps to reality. I think like one thing that's really, really important to realize about Metaflow is that we really want to help data scientists um, at all layers of the stack. Um, there are many other frameworks out there that like maybe um, help you with some layers of the stack, let's say just executing the workflow or something like that. But um, we have seen that like ultimately, like the success of these data science projects is all about the final business value and like how you are able to continuously iterate and improve the models. And we feel that it's kind of important to address like all of the the kind of the, 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 the layers of the stack and not only some of them. And this is just this table here shows like how the different sections in the documentation map to the stack. And, um, and like, for instance, um, like I will be, I can actually like show you some examples, how to do the compute, how to, how to kind of deal with data. And especially like one thing that uh, I really want to emphasize are these middle layers about how to architect the code. And, you know, interestingly, um, many of our users internally are not software engineers by training. So we don't want them to spend too much time thinking about like, 
how to how to architect the code in the sense that should I use classes or like how should I like organize my packages and so forth. And uh, we we want Metaflow to help in like just designing like a decent um, like um, uh, like a decent like a software artifacts that can be run in production, even even for data scientists who are like kind of not really like who don't have a CS degree. And another big part is is really. So does that really mean that yeah. you? are providing standard templates that they can use or yeah. they well, I, I can i can show you actually like a few examples so it will okay. be probably more clear then and then the other part that i wanted to mention highlight is is really the versioning and the fact that versioning really happens out of the box you don't have to do absolutely anything but i mean in the kind of in production settings we feel that it's really really important that like you have a strong uh, lineage and you have a strong um kind of uh, uh, like a model for, for like a model governance and data governance and like metaflow provides that building you don't really have to think about it so Cool. But that's that's kind of the, the big picture. So um, if anyone is interested, I mean, all this information is here in the in the documentation. But um, I, I think it makes sense to kind of uh, get more real, and I can show some examples if it makes sense. Ready to dive in? Yeah, yeah. Let's do uh, that. Let's do it. So um, well, no. First, um, like what I will be showing next might might seem even even like kind of overly simple, and like all that is actually by design. Um, as I mentioned, like we really want to help data scientists where they need most help with, which is actually like kind of a, not the machine learning. So I won't be showing any, 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 any mind blowing machine learning demos since I, I believe that the data scientists can do that those by themselves. But I mean, this is like really like a basic stuff, like going from the, the very foundations upwards. And, um, and like, well, I mean, it all starts like with uh, installing Metaflow. By the way, I hope my keyboard is not too loud. So. I actually had Metaflow installed already, but I mean, you can- Sounds like a mechanical keyboard. Uh, it's not like very mechanical, but I mean, it's like a noisy. <laughs> noisy, just noisy. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, anyway, so you can just do pip install Metaflow. And mm -hmm. what happens after that is that you get this like a nice command line utility called Metaflow. So you can just do Metaflow and uh, you get some top level commands. And by the way, this is all, all in Python. Yeah. Um, so. So but pip I mean, install like, was a giveaway. What's that? Pip install was a dead giveaway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We actually do have a um, like um, support for R as well. I mean that yeah. we will be open sourcing soon. So I mean definitely if you if you are an R user, I mean like you you have a good reason to be happy soon. But um, Python is kind of our main language. Mm -hmm. So um, and like a really good way to get started with Metaflow is actually use the tutorials. I and mean, what you can do is that you can just do Metaflow tutorials pool. And that will actually um, pull a, a set of tutorials that we provide out of the box. They actually go in this directory called Metaflow tutorials. Mm -hmm. so if I show what's here, so now we have all these sub directories. So like hello world. And uh, here like we have a, just one Python file, um, which is the hello world. And actually let me just open, open that file. So it's, it's very straightforward. Python file about 40 lines of code. And um, one thing um, like on the note of, of helping people to architect the software is that we, we ask people to organize their code as a directed acyclic graph, which let me actually like maybe show this in the documentation. So if we go here, basics of Metaflow, what it means is that you have these graphs where you have some, you always have a start step, you always have an end step, and then you can uh, do whatever you want there in between. And like, here's one DAG and uh, actually like, here's the corresponding piece of code in the documentation. So you have a start step and we say self.next goes to self.a, which means that, okay, the next step will be the A, then we do something in A. And then after A, we transition to end and that's the end. So it's exactly the same graph you see here is defined by this piece of code. And uh, actually like, if we go back to this example, you can see that this hello, is, it has exactly the same structure. So we have a start, then we go to hello, it just brings something out and we do end. So really straightforward. I mean, it's just a, it's like kind of a code organizer step. So really okay. shouldn't be any too surprising to anyone. Makes sense? Makes so sense. Now, I, think we, I think I asked this during the interview, but uh, when you describe the, the DAG, uh, orientation and using like annotations and things like that. It reminded me a lot of uh, uh, Facebook's FB Learner. Is yeah. there a lot of inspiration from that? Uh, well, you know, I mean, there are so many like workflow schedulers and then many, many other similar systems out there. So just yeah. the fact that like we are using a DAG, I mean, it's hard to say where exactly the inspiration comes from. I was using this 
um, uh, kind of a like a DAG scheduler called Louis GP4 that came out of Spotify. Um, yep. And uh, of course, there's Airflow, and and there are many many others. And uh, the thing is that like Metaflow is 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 really not only about the DAG. DAG is like a way how we organize code and like we execute things as a DAG, but but it's just like a one layer in that stack. So it's not all of it, but I mean, it's an, it's an important part. But um, mm -hmm. let me show that like how it works. So one thing that uh, Metaflow provides out of the box is that now you can just execute it as a, as a script on, on the command line. So when you just do Python hello world, I mean, you get this like a pretty printed colors. You see that like, okay, so you are using this version of Metaflow and like we actually do some checking. We actually validate that the graph that you have in your code is, is a valid DAG. I mean. Kind of just as a sanity check and then yeah. like a, a nice little touch what you can do is that you can just like write show and what the show does is that it actually just pulls the documentation from the code and gives you an overview of what this project does and uh, of course in this case it's it's really trivial um it starts from start hello and end and then there's some description but you know like what we have seen internally is that when you have a more complex projects and especially if you pull someone else's project and you have no idea what's going on it's very convenient that you can, even without looking at the code, you can just get this overview, like from the code itself. It's just like a small touch. Um, but now, like the thing about Metaflow is that all you have to do to execute the code is that you just do run. And uh, now by default, uh, Metaflow runs the code locally. It actually runs on your laptop. And, and this is something that we uh, really feel quite uh, strongly about that, um, Oftentimes, data scientists really enjoy the local development experience. And like, as I had in the very beginning about those like different um, the phases of data scientists, as long as you like as you're doing stuff on your laptop, things are really easy. So we really want to make that local experience as as, as nice and easy as possible. So you can like, prototype everything on your local machine as you would do with any notebook or or Python script. But in this case, what we did is that we took the DAG and we executed each step of the DAG. So that should be. That should be um, easy enough. And uh, one thing that's worth noticing here is that we have all these IDs. And what happened here is that Metaflow keeps track of every execution that you do. And we give an ID for every run, like every time you run and run, like we give it an ID, like in this case, it's just a timestamp. And, and like we, we keep track of this metadata. And this goes back to the, my point about versioning that like every time you execute something, we, we, we track like what you executed. And like, as I will be showing later on, like we even keep track of the data that like, like a flew through, uh, like flows through the, the graph. So that's, that's pretty important. And uh, well, as I mentioned, this executed locally and what I can do is I can write Metaflow status. And um, well, I had executed something here before, but it also shows that, okay, now I have hello flow available here as well. So, but I mean, nothing, nothing too complicated this far. Let me show you. One example here, like kind of if we go a little bit down from the uh, the documentation, keep going on words. So you can obviously have branches. Um, you can like run these two steps A and B in in parallel. So that's that's pretty convenient. Oftentimes happens in in machine learning workflows. Let's say you have two different models you want to you want to train in parallel or something like that. But something that's even even more interesting is the fact that you can have these fanouts like for each. And um, so what happens here is that we define a, a Python list self.titles, like a three elements in the list. And then we, we see, say here is that we actually want to do a, a for each, a, a fan out over this list. And mm -hmm. then we want to use the self.a, the step a, to, to process each one of these items in the list. So this is basically like a for each loop. Um, and now, Although, again, I mean, this might not seem much. I mean, this is actually like really, really useful for things like uh, hyperparameter grid search. Like what happens all the time is that people define their, their search grid here. And, and then they just say that, okay, I want to do a for each over all parameterizations of my model. And then this step would be your uh, model feeding step. And then like in the end, like you, you do a join step, which then like takes all the results, basically has, does a fan in. And now you can do something like you choose the best performing model or something of that sort. Right. Actually, like let me show you how it works in practice. So let's go here. And if I just write this to a file like this, now we can just execute it. Okay. And now if we run this piece of code, one thing that I wanted to highlight here is that um, you can see that uh, the for each yields three child steps, which means that, okay, we are just doing this like a three-way fan out. 
And uh, you can see that, okay, now we have three different versions of step A. We have the, the ID two, three, and four. four. Yep. And, and one thing that's really worth noticing here is that this PID here actually like refers to a, a kind of an operating system sub process. So we uh, execute each one of these tasks um, uh, as a separate process. And what this means is that um, actually operating system takes care of executing these tasks on different cores. So now even on my lap, laptop, I think I have four different cores or like if you were running this on a server, you might even have 32 different cores. So now the interesting thing is that like, even when you are doing local development on a single box, you can actually take advantage of multi-core parallelism. And it's actually surprising how much you can do even like during local development since you're just distributing the workload over multiple cores, even without using any container management system. And this, as you saw, I mean, it just happened uh, uh, um, like uh, out, uh, out the box that uh, we only define the four each. We know that like these things are independent from each other so we can safely execute them in parallel. Now this example is fairly simple. <clears throat> when you're distributing out uh, these uh, for each tasks, you know you can you know get arbitrarily complex in terms of the semantics, like retries and you know guarantees around you know what's right. being joined, that kind of thing. How you know how far do you go down that path? Yeah, that that's a, that's a great question, and actually um, we have a whole section about that very question. So we have this dealing with failures. So of course, there are many, many ways how things can fail. And like, for instance, here, like you can do retry, you can define different retry policies. What's really, really um, typical as well, let me um, scroll down, is that um, you, let's say you do, um, you do a, a hyperparameter search and just some parameterizations result to invalid models and maybe the model even crashes. And then you can just catch and say that, okay, so even if, if, even if one of these tasks fail, I don't want to fail the whole thing, which is what happens by default. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I want to just like store the invalid results. So I can, I can just like kind of a deal with that afterwards. And is join, uh, is join, does it get the, um, the metadata from for each and it knows that it's looking for the three that were started or is it a listener that's listening to some window of time you know for yeah. things to come in yeah good good question so um now like when we were executing things locally uh, metaflow comes with this kind of a like a local scheduler if you will that actually like waits it knows that this is the craft that we are executing so it knows that it needs to wait for everything to finish now, the important thing about Metaflow is that we don't want to um, kind of a, try to build a yet another DAG scheduler per se. And, and what we do is that we can then export this DAG to different um, scheduler systems. Like, let's say we are now building integration with AWS set functions and, uh, or like technically you could use something like Airflow. So then like it's up to that like other scheduling system to kind of a deal with how to execute the DAG. But usually, I mean, they all, all work the same way. They know that, okay, so now it needs to wait for the fan out to complete. Okay. Right. So actually, like, since you, you ask about the errors, so that like kind of a brought my mind, like, let me, let me show you another like really cool feature that we have. So um, here, well, I mean, first, I mean, let me just like highlight this small feature that we, oh, well, actually like, let me show it here. That obviously like you need to parameterize this model. So let's say in this case, we can just define a parameter. Nothing, nothing. Again, I mean, too special about that. Let me just write, down, like, let's do that. Like another one, like params. Write that to a file. And now what we can do is that when we do uh, help, we can see that actually like we have, now it's just a command line flag for, for specifying the, the alpha. So when we execute this thing, like I think we have a default value 0.01. So we get that and like, well, like really uh, no, no trainer that like we can do something like this. And now you can just parameterize your flow. Nothing, nothing too surprising there. One thing like on the, on the note about failures, well, let's say that like you, you edit your code and you first, I mean, let's say that you do a simple typo here, mm -hmm. something totally meaningless. When you try to execute this thing here again, uh, we actually like a link the code uh, like using PyLint. So, I mean, it just like gives you instant feedback saying that, well, that's not going to work. Well, this is a nice little thing since, you know, especially a problem with using Python for these long running machine learning workflows is that you, it would be extremely frustrating that like if you have to wait for hours for your models to train only to see that like in the end you had like a silly typo like this. So it's just like do the simple, simple thing there. 
But um, now, of course, like what happens more often is that you kind of have some problem in your kind of a, uh, like the, the, the business logic of the code. So let's say a typical thing, what might, might, uh, what might happen in numerical code is that you just divide by zero here. So now if we try to execute this code, uh, what happens is that uh, not surprisingly, you get this uh, zero division error. So, um, and uh, now imagine that like, instead of having this instant execution, you had waited for hours and hours for your models to train. And then like you have a, maybe some silly error in the logic that you do divide by zero in the end. And now um, it would be extremely frustrating to have to train the models again. I mean, just after you have fixed that basic error. So for that, what we provide is that, let's say we fix the error there. What you can do is that you can just say, um, resume. And now what happens is that it actually, instead of executing or ex re-executing the start step that worked perfectly fine, it was the end step that failed. We are saying that we are actually cloning the results of a previous run and reusing those results and only re-executing the step that failed. And now you can imagine that like, if you have that complex workflow that first downloads data from Spark and it takes 20 minutes to execute the query and then it trains the model and it takes two hours to train the model. And then finally it does some like a final aggregation of results and then you divide by zero. It's super, super convenient that you can save like three hours of your time just by doing resume um, instead of like having to re-execute everything. So this pattern of like running and resuming is, is really powerful. Right. So uh, now I, I want to show you like one more interesting demo, but there's one thing that I, I think I need to highlight first. So as you mentioned uh, before as well, there are of course like many of these workflow execution systems. And one of the really crucial questions is that like, how do you deal with data and how do you deal with state? So, I mean, just executing this uh, computation in, in a graph, I mean, that's one thing. But um, let's say that you actually have some data processing going on. And like, let's start with something as simple as that. Like you just have a, like a variable, right, like here. And uh, let's say I want to access the variable here. So here, like I just want to increment. So obviously I need the previous value of X and I, I will increment it by one and let's print it out. So uh, here. And with, with many other um, workflow scheduling systems, it's up to the user to decide how they want to persist data inside their flow. I mean, maybe you want to they, they, like uh, store it in, in some uh, database or maybe you want to store it in, in um, some kind of uh, like a data warehouse or something, but that typically adds a lot of boilerplate in your code. And also it kind of forces you to think what you want to store and persist all the time. And uh, Metaflow, when you do this, actually I can show Working you. Working all these questions yeah. can be a lot of, uh... Yeah, there are a lot of considerations that you exactly. have to take into account if you're doing this from scratch. Totally, yeah. So now um, what happens is that, well, I mean, not surprisingly, you get the um, axis two, which again, I mean, like seems totally uh, no nonsense. One thing that's worth noticing here that, as I mentioned before, these guys are executed in separate Python processes as separate Python interpreters. So you might realize that there must be some magic going on behind the scenes to actually make this happen. It's not just a single Python execution. And, and like the, the magic that goes on behind the scenes is that when you do um, these instance variables like self.x, we actually automatically persist these artifacts in the data store um, so that like they, they become immutable artifacts that you can refer later on. So let me show you how. So here, like for instance, what we can do is that we can do dump and let's take this guy here. And we can see that actually we have persisted the value of X. And, um, and like the nice thing about this is that uh, not only it's available to the code itself, but you can inspect these values afterwards. And that is maybe one of the most important features of Metaflow. That now imagine having these ML workflows and you, this might be something that um, is, is, is running in production and updating every day uh, automatically. And now if something fails, you can go back and you can inspect the state of the workflow at any given step and like see what was going on. And then you can resume locally and you can try to fix it. So this is really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I mean, just like doing things on the command line is one thing, but uh, the really nice thing what we like is that you can actually like even uh, do these inspections in a notebook. So let me show this very basic notebook that I have. So I just import Metaflow. Uh, Metaflow actually like gives you the kind of the, the state of the Metaflow universe. 
So in this case, we see all the things that like I executed, I executed the hello flow for each parameter flow. Also I executed this, I tested this conduct thing before. So I have like basically a, now a, a kind of an audit trail of everything that was executed on this machine. And now let's take the, the first one. So let's, yeah. The, the underlying uh, data store, state store for this, is this, uh, you know, dot files in your directory or is it, is there a config that's connecting it out to S3 yeah. or something like that? Yeah, yeah, a great question. So actually like, like let's see, it's work. So um, in this case, actually like if we show the metadata, it, it tells us that we are in this case storing the metadata locally in this directory okay. here. Um, but actually like this is not the way how we uh, do things internally at Netflix. Like we use S3 as the data store. So we have a one global view to everything that's going on. And I can actually show a demo of that as well. So it's purely a configuration option if you want to use a local data store or S3. We basically do everything in S3 by default. Okay. But yeah, I mean, like, I just wanted to show that here's the, the hello flow that I just executed. Now I can ask, like, what's the latest run of the, this uh, hello flow? Okay, so it's, it's this guy here. Let's assign it to a variable. And the, the really cool thing is that I can actually see everything that happened. In this case, um, the hello flow had two steps. I had start and end. And uh, let's see. For instance, now I can do here, like let's look at the end step and you, I can actually look at the data. And I can see that like, okay, so the, the, um, the value of X here at the end step was two. Um, and uh, well, I mean, again, this, this might seem um, quite straightforward as it should be, but this comes super, super powerful, like in, in kind of a real machine learning workflows. And let me show you one more realistic example to kind of make it, make it more concrete. So we have this one uh, tutorial here that, um, uh, analyzes some basic movies data. So we are Netflix, so we are interested in analyzing movies and, and TV shows. So here's just a, like a CSV of this. I, I think that these are box office numbers, just public data set about the movie title and title year and, and the genres of this movie and the, the gross box office, I guess, globally. It's a bunch of data here. And now this is a bit more uh, realistic looking uh, Metaflow workflow that um, just does some utility function here. But one nice feature that we provide is that you can actually do include file, which is kind of a special kind of parameter that says that, okay, we can uh, use some piece of data, piece of input data, and we kind of include it in the run itself. And the, and the really important thing to note about this is that this means that we are actually taking an immutable snapshot of the data itself, and we are versioning that with the workflow. So you basically have this like end-to-end -end data and model versioning with this that like, you know, exactly the, the source data, you know, exactly the model and everything that went on. So that's, that's really nice. And uh, if you keep wondering that, well, I mean, it seems quite expensive. We are actually storing all these artifacts in a content address manner. So we do deduplication automatically. So obviously let's say you do multiple iterations and the movies don't change, the CSV doesn't change. I mean, we don't store multiple copies. Uh and now uh, inside the flow itself, actually we are quite unopinionated how you do your modeling work. So in this case, we are just using pandas. Like we are just using pandas and then CSV, like really the, the kind of the bread and butter of all, all data science. And uh, in this example, we just want to um, like do some like a, a analysis genre by genre. The, um, the, the one fun thing that, uh, let me actually like comment that out. I want to show that later on. Uh, what we want to do is that here, like we want to analyze each uh, genre as a, as a separate for each brand uh, uh, branch, and um, you can you can imagine that like let's say if you have large data sets, like we internally we have data sets that may be a few terabytes, so we want to shard it over multiple shards. So this is like doing the sharding by genre, um, and uh, then we are just like producing some output output data frame. So let, let me actually execute this guy here. So. Let's just running it. And uh, now I think we had uh, like some, uh, like 22 different genres, I guess. That's uh, more than I, I thought, but I mean, I guess there were that <laughs> many. Yeah. And uh, now it's running. And now it did all the processing there. And uh, now again, I mean, like we of course have uh, like all the artifacts um, that were produced during the execution. And let me show you a notebook that I had prepared before that, um, shows like what it does so here like okay so we are like accessing now this like a movie stats flow that we just executed i think let's see this is like a 476 
and this should be yeah this is the same guy 476 so that's the id the right guy and now like the, the really nice thing about being able to inspect these artifacts is that like we can use all the tools in notebooks like matplotlib then to actually inspect the data so we can see that okay so this is the the gross box office like across the different different genres or like let's say like how things have um, evolved over over time so you can use all the tools that you love in notebooks to visualize the state of your model. And this is actually um, like really- um, so you're, yeah. you're not uh, executing the DAG in the notebook, you're inspecting the metadata from the last run. Exactly, yeah. That. So yeah, so if you um, look at here, so we are accessing the latest run and then like we are accessing data from this run. And yeah. now, exactly, and, and, and like that was a great question. And I, I think that the question that of course like might come to your mind and like maybe in the minds of many of the viewers that okay, so obviously you can do the same thing in a notebook. Why would you run it as a metaflow? And let me just like show you why. So now, like let's say that like this is a real machine learning project. And of course I keep iterating on this. And let's say that um, I, I make some changes here. And let's say that like in this case, I'm just um, like multiplying the the, the, the growth of box office for family by by hundred fold. So, for whatever reason, I want to make the change. And uh, now, if I run this, and let me actually like show one more feature that we have, which is called tagging. So we can give it a tag for this execution. Let's say that I have this like a special like a family version of the model. Maybe I it's just like a like family content a lot, and I execute this thing. By the way, you can do the inspection while the flow is executing. So it's kind of nice if it takes hours, you don't have to wait for everything but seem to finish, but um, that's not that important. In this case, um, now can we can see that the, the, yeah. the status of the run, whether a run is in progress uh, via, via the uh, notebook. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's actually a typical case that people they, some people even have hacked kind of a progress bars and stuff like that, so they can see especially uh -huh. if you have white for each is that like how many of them have finished. And um, actually, like on that note, like well, I mean by now you may have noticed that I'm not demoing any UIs per se. And the, the interesting thing is that we are actually using notebooks as a UI, and like thanks to this inspection capability, we have different kind of a quote unquote UIs for different use cases. And, and the reason for this is that since we support so many different use cases, it's very hard to have a one size fits all UI. And, and many of our data scientists are super comfortable uh, creating their own visualizations in the notebook. So instead of us like trying to replicate the functionality of a notebook, we just say that use notebooks for this. But now uh, what I wanted to show you is the fact that now we multiplied uh, family by 100. So what happens is that of course the results are now different. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and, and this is of course like exactly like what happens in, in data science and on a daily basis. So you iterate on something, now you eyeball the results, the, the results look, look like all different. So of course, again, I mean, you could do this in a notebook. Now, the interesting thing is that, um, let's say that like we go back to the original version and comment that uh, crazy thing out and let's like run that again, again like tagging that as, as a kind of a good version. And now while that is executing, I can actually make a change. So here, like we were just accessing the latest run all the time. But now what we can do instead, we can say that, okay, let's take the, um, like the everything that was tagged as, as family. Um, and like we can list all the runs that had the tag and like we can just take the, the one version here. So when that's actually the one like with the family tag. But I mean, this guy is it's now done as well. So I think like what we can do is we can take the good version and like now that's a different version again. And now we are back to this version that like kind of shows the right numbers. So what do you see here basically happening is that we have this versioning system kind of a, like for your notebooks. And this is of course a really big problem when you are using notebooks for data science that notebooks are really, really amazing for doing visualizations and doing this ad hoc exploration and inspection. But when it comes to actually having strongly versioned results, notebooks are pretty hard. But like what you can do here is that you can use notebooks what they are really good at, like for doing the visualizations while you can use Metaflow for like versioning your experiments and versioning your data. So you can easily go back and forth between different versions. Right. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And so you access that by the tag. I'm imagining you could also access that by the run ID. Um, Correct. Well. Correct. And like one thing that's um, really useful in a, in a larger organization 
is that we also organize everything by user. So now let's say you have a multiple data scientists working on different versions of the model. You can like look that, okay, I want to see my colleague's version and I want to now see my version. And all these are totally uh, isolated. So you can never step on, on someone else's toes. Mm -hmm. And this makes it really easy that I, in a notebook, I can just easily compare even a single notebook. I can compare different versions and, and then like do the plots, like seeing like, let's say how the, how the accuracy has improved over time and stuff like that. And now that seems like a place where as a user, I might want to see some kind of UI that organizes my results and allows me to take a look at them. All right. uh, yeah. Is that pissed or am I, do I, have to create all that myself via the notebooks? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. I like quite honestly, like what has happened this far is that um, like typically data scientists work on a, on a kind of a number of models, but they don't like typically they are not interested in absolutely everything that happens at the company. So they kind of have a mental model of their, their space and they have a notebooks for their space. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of has worked pretty well. And of course you can explore like via the command line or the notebook. I'm not like a fully satisfied, like kind of a, the, the fact that we don't have the discovery UI and it's actually something that like we will probably be working on this year. But um, like realistically, uh, like usually like when you do the actual work, I mean, there's a, some finite domain that you are interested in and you can kind of navigate your own space quite fine. Right. So now like one, one more thing um, that I want to show, well, I mean, maybe one of the many, but uh, the next thing I want to show is that, well, I mean, here I've been just like a casually showing like how you can do data science, how you can use notebooks, so forth. And I, I mentioned early on, like at the very top of the stack, now you can use any libraries you want. And, uh, and you can use TensorFlow, you can use PyTorch, like, and then so forth. And obviously we were using Pandas and Matplotlib and then so forth. But now there is this really, really crucial question for um, production workflows that how do you actually um, maintain uh, reproducibility and, and the kind of the, um, the consistent results like when using these external libraries. So a good example might be that maybe you had a model that was using TensorFlow 1.14 before and now there's TensorFlow 2.0 and, uh, and like what do you do? You can't just upgrade the version automatically. Well, I mean, do you want to modify your code and break the old version? Not so obvious. So we overall, like we felt and we saw a lot of pain um, about the dependency management overall because of the the amazing Cambrian explosion of different libraries that are out there, people use all kinds of things, but it kind of oftentimes might lead to quite a kind of hairball of, of dependencies and then kind of that like a dependency hell type of situation. What we do and what we provide out of the box is that we integrate with Conda package manager. So um, like this is just a kind of a normal Conda that many, many viewers might have used before. Uh, and of course you are like, I actually like I'm running like all the Metaflow examples here using Conda. But what's really, really interesting is that we have a built-in Conda integration. And what it means is that like at the step level, at the level of an individual function, you can define the libraries that this function needs. And what this uh, means is that for instance, you can have a workflow that uses two different versions of TensorFlow if you want to, let's say, test like uh, the older version versus the new version. And um, here I just wanted to have a super simple example where I, um, I'm just like pulling this optimized package for computing edit distances, Python Levenstein. Um, I mean, I just do at Conda. I, I mean, it's just like a one line of code. I, now I can import this package inside this step. And I'm just using this to measure the edit distance between two strings, foo and move. And uh, now that the, the nice thing is that like all I have to do is that I can, well, if I try to execute that as usual, Actually, interestingly, like Pylint in this case notices that there is no such module installed in my system because it's not, I mean, it's only available. So I can actually, like in this case, I will just silence Pylint. Now it instructs me that, well, I also need to say that I, I really do want to use Conda, so I'm, I'm doing that. And now when I'm executing, Uh, what happens is that like here at the end step, Metaflow automatically sets up a Conda environment with the Levenstein package for you. And now, I mean, the, the edit distance between Foo and Mu is one, so that's correct. Um, and here, like you didn't have to manage the virtual environments by yourself. And like one thing that like we have seen happening as well is that, well, when you are using systems like Conda, then you have to kind of a sh maybe have one big environment that has everything, or maybe you have a multiple different environments and, and you have to manage them by hand. But in this case, 
like you can use the code itself to define that like this function requires these uh, these modules and like I can even pin down the versions and we also do the dependency resolution making sure that like the transitive dependencies don't change like behind your back like while you're executing these things in production. And if my needs are more simple, I don't want to use multiple versions of TensorFlow in a given flow. Is there a, a global set of settings yeah. like requirements.txt or something that I can use? Yeah, actually like what we do is that you can just like also move it here. Ah, got it. Right. So this works equally well. So indeed, I mean, that's of course a very common case that like you have a one, one workflow where like if, if, if all steps need the same dependencies. So you can just do that at the top level as okay. well. Right, so, and now like the important thing is that like all these pieces of course fit together. So you get the, uh, you can specify Conda environments, the artifacts get persisted, you can do four inches, you can do four inches with Conda and like it's kind of really composable in that sense. So now mm -hmm. as, as like, um, let me just do a time check, I guess we still have, do we still have a few minutes? Uh, we still do have a few minutes, yeah. Yeah, so now, um, one thing that I do want to touch is that like how how does this actually work in production? That's a question that we get often that yeah, I mean all this sounds really good and fine, but like how does actually Netflix do this at the Netflix scale? And yeah. um, and now we have this whole section about about scalability and uh, our story for scalability is basically that um, for, well first we assume that you have that compute layer, which oftentimes is some kind of a container management system. And in the container management system, oftentimes you can specify the resources that your function needs or like your container needs. Um, so you can say, for instance, that like, well, maybe I need a box that has 60 gigabytes of memory and or maybe 16 CPUs. And in this case, like we execute, Metaflow automatically ships this function to the container management system and, and like executes the function like on the box that has these like required resources. Okay. And, uh, now um, I want to make this this real. And uh, now one thing that we uh, wanted to provide as as a part of open source uh, package is that we realized that not all data scientists necessarily have access to this kind of direct access to container management system, or maybe they are individuals who don't even have a container management system. So that's why we actually have this like really nice service like for evaluating these scalability features. It's called Metaflow Sandbox, and um, how it works is that we actually provide you an AWS environment where you can evaluate uh, Metaflow for real in, in a real cloud environment that provides you a personal compute cluster as well as uh, S3 uh, space for your data. And how it works is that you actually, you can go to Metaflow Sandbox and uh, you have to sign up and everything. I have done that already. Uh, but like after you have, a, like we have provisioned you a, a sandbox, like we have this magic string here and if I just click that, and now I can go to my terminal here, and I can do Metaflow Computer Sandbox. And I just copy paste the string, the ugly string here. You, um, and now what happens is that magically, let's see, if I do status, uh, instead of using local data store and, and local client, uh, we are now using this global metadata service that obviously we provide as open source as well. But in this case, we just automatically set it up for you. So it actually goes to Amazon and, and this is your personal uh, sandbox uh, environment okay. now. So that's that's nice. And like now what we can do is that we can run the hello flow again. And now, well, I mean, it's, it's a tiny bit slower because now it actually has to go to AWS. And one thing that you might notice is that now instead of having those timestamp IDs, we get these short IDs because now the metadata service can provision us unique IDs for execution. So it looks a bit nicer. But now also like what happened in this case is that instead of storing the data locally, now this data actually got stored in Amazon S3 and it's, it's like persistent, it's available to everybody there. And I can actually like prove that this is the case. Um, what we do also as a part of the sandbox is that we give you a notebook environment in Amazon SageMaker. So this is, as you can see, like here in the URL, I mean, now I'm actually using internet and I'm going to SageMaker. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had like, let's see if I open this one. I think I had a basic example here. So actually like, let me see the get more data here as well. And uh, now if I show you this guy, you can see that like this notebook is now accessing the same metadata service that I was 
I was sending data locally to. So now if I'm listing Metaflow, I do have the execution of the hello flow. And uh, let's see if I do the flow again. And uh, let's see what's that guy. And I can do latest run. And uh, let's see what was the latest uh, run here. So I guess, what's that? Was it the 12? Yeah, yeah, that, that should be 12. So actually like, let me see if, uh, if that like run, like how come it's not showing? Uh, oh. oh yeah, yeah, that should be, I should like to see 12 of, of that guy as well. Um, so, and this is, oh, sorry. I mean, that's the, the flow. Yeah, and uh, I see why I have 12 of this guy. Oh, great. So I actually like, yeah, I think that that's the one thing that I should have done here. Good point. Let's see if this fixes it. I will explain like what's going on here. So yeah, my, my bad. So actually <laughs> like the, the thing, as I mentioned before, um, we namespace all executions by user. And now when I was executing here locally, I'm actually like running as my own user and like this notebook, I mean, it doesn't know what's my local user. So it's only looking at the user specific to this notebook. So when I do namespace none, I can actually like see everything that's happening in the, in the whole universe. So now I can see the, the run well. And now when we look at this here, um, so we can look at the end step. And I think that like this was the flow, right? Where we added the one data artifact, if I remember correctly. Yes, so we should have X here. So when we look at this guy, we see that the value of two here. And um, cool. like what, what really happened here is that like we were executing something locally. So what's worth noticing is that this executed on my laptop, but somehow magically behind the scenes, uh, the value, this like artifact, like ended up being available in a SageMaker notebook. And this is really like the power of, of Metaflow that you can execute these workflows anywhere. And like we upload everything to S3 and then like anybody can like run the notebook anywhere and like see, see what other people have been working on. Mm -hmm. Now um, about the scalability point, what I can do is that I can say with batch. And um, we, out of the box, we provide integration to AWS batch, as I mentioned before. And what AWS batch does is that it's basically this container management system that provisions automatically EC2 instances for you. So in this case, when I'm running the code and I'm saying that I'm running it with batch, I didn't make any changes in the code. But now Metaflow is shipping these steps to be executed in the cloud. So in this case, we can see this is actually the, the AWS batch execution ID or the, the, the ID for this job. And now we can see that uh, like what's the status of the job. And now what AWS batch does for us behind the scenes is that it now it's scaling up the cluster. I mean, there's a small delay because I, it has been a while since I was using this last time that is like now actually spinning up the instances so that it, it can execute this function for us. And okay, the, uh, uh, the uh, I see where it's spinning up instances or, uh, you know, the, a cluster to, to run these tasks. Metaflow itself, is that running local to the machine or is that a runtime or, you know? Yeah, yeah, good question. So there are kind of two parts to it. There is the question that where do you actually execute your code? Let's say like your model feeding code and, and like where do you do the orchestration? And in this case, we are doing the orchestration on my laptop. So it's kind of still my laptop that's in control yeah. and it's shipping these individual units of computation to AWS batch. And now the batch, as you can see, it's kind of executing these steps. Uh, well, presumably yeah. the orchestration is just Python and I can run that any place that uh, runs Python. Is there a specific uh, facility in the package to get that up and running and launch easily? Um, the, uh, like, what, what do you mean exactly? Um, meaning, is there a, you know, a utility as part of Sandbox that will run the orchestrator in AWS? Oh, yeah, what? yeah, right, right. So, um, well, let me first, um, like, this is what I'm demoing here. Um, and you can see that it's actually like it executed in the cloud, it produced the same yeah. result and everything. Now, um, like this is this is part of the sandbox functionality and you can you can like easily try this out by yourself by going to the uh, metaflow.org slash sandbox 
we need to provision you a sandbox, but that works by the way, there's obviously no cost to you. Now that's not something that like you want to use in, in production. So what do you do is that then like we actually provide you uh, instructions, uh, how to deploy everything to, to your own AWS environment. So there are like very, very detailed uh, um, instructions here, how you set up your own AWS environment to, to do the same thing. Now, like since you asked specifically about the, the scheduling part, now, uh, like as I mentioned, like what we did here is that it was your laptop, it was my laptop in, in control and executing all these things, shipping compute to the cloud. However, this is not the way how you want to run production workloads. Obviously the production workload shouldn't be orchestrated by your laptop. Um, and for that, we are actually now providing a, um, or like soon we will be providing integration to step functions. So what you will be able to do is that in this case, and this is actually something we have internally, but it just uses a different internal scheduler that you can do something like step functions export. Um, and then this will take your code, take your DAG, no modifications, and it will export that to step functions. So it will be step functions actually orchestrating all this compute. And then still, I mean, all the model artifacts will end up in S3 as before, but now you don't have to have your lap laptop running to actually get, let's say, to, to model to update on a daily basis and, and so mm -hmm. forth, if, if that makes sense. And do you envision, uh, or, or maybe you do this internally, um, setting up like different uh, CloudWatch rules or things like that to track some of the things that you're looking at here? As yeah. Opposed to looking at it in a console? Yeah, well, um, okay, so there are a couple of different sides to it. There's the operational side. Yeah, uh, like you, you really want to, of course, like have alerting and, and monitoring like for, and that's actually like one of the reasons why we really like to rely on this um, kind of a quote unquote production grade uh, schedulers like step functions uh, mm -hmm. is that they oftentimes have a pretty good operational story, how you monitor these things and how you set up alerting. And also, I mean, it kind of depends on the company, how you want to do it uh, exactly. So we have a, like plenty of, uh, like we actually have a whole dedicated team internally at Netflix, like keeping the orchestrator running. I mean, not only for Metaflow, obviously, but for all ETL. Yeah. Yeah. And we envision that like many other companies are kind of a, in the same boat. Um, now, when it comes to the models themselves, actually like what we do internally at Netflix is that we, we use the same notebook paradigm um, to, to monitor things even in production uh, in notebooks. But, and we are using this project called Paper Mill which is also yep. actively developed by, um, by Netflix that then like renders these notebooks in a headless manner. So you don't have to go in a Jupyter notebook and click run, but I mean, it kind of gets executed like as a part of the scheduled workflow. So you go to an address and you always see the latest version of the notebook. So it's also mm -hmm. an open source package and, uh, and uh, I, I highly recommend people to use it. It's actually like really, really useful if you like notebooks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, if, yeah. If you like look at the, uh, the documentation here, like now we covered like many, many basics. Um, we showed how to, um, I showed how to inspect results in the notebook. I showed like something about the resume, like a scaling out and up. There's more details to that, but that's the basic idea. You just like a ship out compute to the cloud. We didn't mm -hmm. touch much about the loading and storing data. That's actually a really interesting topic in itself. Metaflow comes with the built-in S3 client. That's extremely high throughput. You can get up to 20 gigabits per second. That's really cool. We actually like releasing more stuff related to that later. We um, talk about the external libraries, how to use the Conda decorator. We um, you ask about how to how to deal with failures. So we have timeouts, catches, retries, so forth. And then, well, I mean, I, I even kind of um, like I showed that like one issue like related to namespaces and how to organize results. So, <laughs> so that was covered as well. Um, I just cool. want to highlight a few things that's coming up soon. So we have, like I mentioned, we have a support for R language coming up. So Kind of the, you know, it's basically the same feature parity as with the Python version. It's just the R syntax layer. Mm -hmm. one, one thing um, that I mentioned is the support for step functions coming up. And uh, there's a one like a thing that we have internally, which is how you can deploy these models as a microservice. Something that we are evaluating how much appetite there is in the, in the open source. Definitely reach out to us like on, on Vitter or on, on GitHub issues if this is something interesting to you. Also, and, and data data, uh, yeah. those being deployed out via Lambda or um, yeah, good something question. else? Yeah, well, you know, internally we have a function as a service system, kind of like Lambda. Uh, one thing that makes Lambda today a bit problematic is that oftentimes these models may require GPUs or, or like otherwise they might be a bit yeah. longer running than what Lambda allows. Time limits. Yeah. So mm -hmm. SageMaker hosting might be one option. So we are kind of evaluating. So definitely I encourage anyone like who's interested in reaching out to us. And, uh, 
and yeah, but I mean, the Metaflow data frame is a component for then um, doing the data processing inside flows. Um, and we leverage the Arrow project, like for doing uh, really efficient in-memory processing. Like definitely uh, something that like we would like to open source in the future as well. And we do actually have a Slack bot as well. So which is nice when you have this like, a, it's basically providing the same functionality as the notebook. So you can inspect things in Slack. It's kind of a fun nice. experiment and it works for a certain use cases really well. Very cool. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. Avila, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through Metaflow. It definitely, uh, you know, seeing it makes it a lot more tangible than talking about it, although that's awesome too. And thank yeah. you for the previous podcast, but this was great. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks for having me. And uh, uh, if you are interested in giving Metaflow a try, definitely go to metaflow.org. Um, we have a few different ways how you can get in touch. Definitely uh, come to our chat room at chat.metaflow.org. You can email us at health at metaflow.org. Like we are very helpful. Also, we are really just wanting to kind of uh, make make all data scientists as successful as we have been able to make people in, inside Netflix. So we are not selling anything at the end of the day. We are just here to help. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sam. Bye.